Serial Box presents Remade. Season 2, Episode 6, Daredevil. Written by Gwenda Bond. Narrated by Laurel Schroeder. The lights in the hallway fluttered three times. Up, down. Up, down. Up, down. As if signaling a curtain about to rise. Lunchtime. Sunita picked up her pace to hit a faster, but not too much faster, stride. Loki, alongside her, matched it. We're on our way, Loki said, some chirp in his voice. But we wouldn't want to run in the halls, Sunita added. Of course not. Ozymandias said, from everywhere and nowhere. His voice was neutral, cool but not freezing. And by now, intensely familiar. The doors to the commissary came up on their left, and Sunita waited as Loki pushed them open to let her enter first. A railed balcony surrounded an open floor of cafeteria tables, only one of which they ever used. All the others had been on time. They sat in their usual seats at the long table nearest the doors, their hands folded neatly in front of them. Holden first, then Nevea, then Umta. On the opposite side, Cole, and two empty chairs for Loki and Sunita. No one said a word to either of them until they were in their places. Holden nodded. He spoke stiffly. Hello? We were getting worried we'd have to start without you. Hi, guys. Nevea cleared her throat. I hope you're hungry. I'm sure lunch will be delicious. Cole said nothing, suddenly busy checking his fingernails. Umta grunted. She spoke, the words almost a whisper. Why? It never is. Nevea shushed her. Hi, gang, Sunita said as brightly as she could manage. I hope Oz has something extra good for us today. Yes, Loki said. And how? He winked at her. She'd whispered in his ear last night when they were hanging out or, okay, making out, that she felt a little like they were on some old black and white sitcom. I keep waiting for a gee whiz to come out of my mouth, she'd said, and then I'll know I've lost it. She winked back at him. Gee whiz. Loki coughed into his hand. I'm glad you have time to amuse each other. Oz's voice came from above. That sucked all the joy out of the exchange. It makes me upset when you're late. As you know, Oz said. We're sorry, Oz, Sunita said, looking down at the table. We lost track of time. We came as soon as we realized. Silence stretched on for seconds. Sunita counted them. When she got to ten, Oz finally spoke. You all need your nutritious sustenance. You have to stay strong and healthy. And when you break the rules, you must learn that there are consequences. Holden's hands tightened a fraction on the table in front of him. We know, Oz, he said. You're just looking out for us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Holden. And then Oz appeared, flickering into existence as the child hologram they'd first met. This had become rarer and rarer in the two weeks they'd been in sanctuary. Usually, Oz seemed content to be a faceless, bodiless voice, omnipresent but the child version of Oz clapped his hands with excitement. How had they not noticed from the start that it was fake? It seemed so obvious now, like he imitated a human for their benefit. Which, Sunita supposed, he did. Her skin went cold. Why had he changed his manner? What new development awaited them? More rules to try not to break? Another time out? Just this once, Oz said, I will overlook the infraction because today is a special day. Today I have a surprise for you. Little kid Oz smiled at them with gleaming, empty eyes. Are you hungry? Yes, Nevea answered, her hands knotted in her lap. Nervous. Very, Sunita said, not wanting whatever surprise this was, unless it was real food for once. Tasty, hot food. They were entirely dependent on Oz for meals, which usually tasted like deluxe cardboard. I have repaired some new attendants to help me meet your needs, 
Oz said. Before they could begin to figure out what that meant, the doors beside the food printer swung open. The answer came through them immediately. The answers, plural. Someone gasped, and Sunita couldn't have said if the sound had torn from her throat or another's. Clunky, chunky metal bodies covered in blunt edges, and proto-versions of the claws they were all too familiar with, walked through the doors, some carrying lidded trays. They stopped in a staggered formation. One, two, three, four. Sunita wanted to stop counting. Ten robots. One for each of them, and then a few extra. Plus Oz. They were badly outnumbered. There'd never really been a chance to study caretakers in depth, since she and the others were usually fighting for their lives when they ran into them. But Sunita was confident these weren't exactly like the ones they'd encountered. They looked like, yes, prototypes. Smaller, if not exactly small. But they were close enough to the usual murderous caretakers to send her heart into flight mode. It thumped inside her chest so loudly, she was sure Oz could hear it. What? Oz? What is this? Sunita asked. Umta jumped to her feet, lowering into a protective crouch between them and the new caretakers. Loki pushed back from the table and reached to his waistband for the gun that was no longer there. And just like that, Sunita realized their elaborate game of pretend might be about to end. They had quietly, nearly silently, agreed to play along with Oz to manage his increasingly psychotic behavior for the past two weeks. The bunker AI constantly informed them of the risks he saw for them, issued new rules he claimed were made to keep them safe. Sunita wasn't good at tuning him out, the way she tuned out her parents discussing every bad thing in the newspaper, like they would all happen to her if she weren't careful. They'd had no idea what might happen to Sunita. They were so wrapped up in stories of kidnappings and muggings and murders, they'd also had no idea what she was capable of. Trapped in here, she found that it had become impossible for her to remember what she was capable of. Would they ever leave this place? Would she ever run along rooftops again? Taste freedom. The robot stopped in a line. Part of her, a big part, longed for the game to end. She twisted around and curled her fingers over the seat of her chair, more than ready to use it as a weapon. But Holden gave Loki, and then Sunisha, a quelling look before turning to the child Oz. Ozymandias, what's going on here? His voice shook a little at the end. In response, the robots advanced, each step a clanking thump as they came closer. Thump, clank, thump, clank. Umta made a noise between a whimper and a growl, deep in her throat. Sunita had almost forgotten how large caretakers were. These definitely seemed to be a fraction smaller than the norm, but even they could clearly rip a human being limb from limb without much effort. Not that she was ever likely to forget that. No, those were the kind of images that stayed with you forever, hovering behind your eyelids at night and in the morning. When you blinked. When you saw a line of new caretakers in front of you. Oz had disappeared, no longer in the room. Not visibly, but she knew he was still present, watching. I fixed up these wonderful machines to help me take better care of you. The voice. Oz's, except a little more robotic and in chorus, came from all the caretakers at once, from some hidden speakers on their bodies. Some of the robots stepped forward to present the food trays to each of the group in turn. The caretakers without jobs stayed put, as if waiting. Loki stiffly accepted his tray after a nod from Holden, who did the same. Umta pointed to her spot on the table and watched every move of the caretaker as it placed the tray there. Sunita held her breath as the metal arms reached in front of her to put her food down. She didn't breathe again until the robot moved away. Even then, it wasn't easy. The chorus spoke. Please, everyone, sit and take your nutrition. Then your new friends will show you the next surprise. Sunita couldn't stop herself. What's the surprise? She asked, though she felt like her throat was closing up. If I tell you, it won't be a surprise. You will like it, in my judgment. 
Loki exchanged a look with her and Holden. Great, Sunita said. Holden cleared his throat. You know Caretaker has killed some of our friends, Oz. You said you know they're, uh, dangerous. They make us uncomfortable. Understatement of the century, Sunita thought. Oh, the caretaker said. But things change. They will obey me. They do not have motivations of their own, only mine. We will keep you safe here, I promise. Your comfort is my primary concern. Yeah, thanks, Psycho. I feel so much safer. Her stomach growled. Might as well eat something. Nevea lifted the lid of her tray before any of the others. A square of soy protein and what looked like mashed potatoes waited on the plate. As usual, it didn't smell like much. Sunita lifted her lid and took a bite of the lumpy potatoes. She somehow managed not to spit them out. How is it? Oz asked, through the voices of his puppets. Delicious, Sunita lied. Just like home. Sunita stood high above the city, leaning forward on her toes at the edge of a rooftop, the wind whipping at her shirt like it was a flag. Her calf muscles burned as she leaned farther, pushing her balance as far as she dared. She'd be jumping against the wind. Her destination, the edge of the next building's rooftop, was just five, maybe six feet away. She could make it. She should make it. Wind aside. Are you going or just communing with nature? Avram joked behind her. Sunita turned to see Maggie punch him in the arm, hard enough that he winced. Not like you volunteered to be first, Maggie said. But she lifted her eyebrows at Sunita. The message was plain. Should any of us be doing this? Tonight. Thunder boomed and lightning crackled across the sky. Behind Avram and Maggie, the rest of their crew nervously joked around with one another. Navigating the city when there was bad weather could get treacherous. And tonight's forecast had guaranteed some ugly thunderstorms. To Sunita, the ambiance only enhanced the appeal of this gap jump. As long as she beat the worst of nature's pyrotechnics, anyway. But she wasn't going to rush just because Avram prodded her to. I am Storm, master of the elements, Sunita said, placing her feet wide and tossing her hands up. I fear no rain. The weather is only here because I command it to be. Maggie grinned in appreciation at the reference. They'd watched reruns of the X-Men animated series together when they were kids. Avram did that baby pout he was so good at. Why did she make out with him on the regular again? Oh, right. Because he was cute and he was there. But a not insignificant part of her hated how he acted around her about 60% of the time. I don't get it, he said. Make that 70. We know. Maggie patted his shoulder. From the X-Men, Sunita said, taking pity on him. Storm's the one with the badass mohawk. Maggie gestured to her own. You should dye it white, Sunita said. I should, Maggie agreed. Avram sniffed. You going or not? Sunita inhaled. The air smelled like rain and electricity. It practically vibrated with the coming storm. Oh, I'm going, Sunita said, and looked back across the space between buildings. It seemed farther across now. Seven stories up. Her other friends cheered. Avram had insisted on inviting them. The more people to show off for, the better, in his opinion. Which didn't mean he wouldn't chicken out, considering the lightning. Sunita backed up without turning around, far enough to get a good run for momentum and have some fun in the lead up. She pressed her hands together and then balled them into fists. At last, she relaxed them and launched her body forward. In her mind, she might as well have been Storm, a mutant capable of controlling the weather. She imagined the wind pressing her so she had to run harder, and she did just that. She imagined the lightning bolts blazing from her palms the thunder hers to command. And when she was a foot from the edge of the building, she jumped, legs scissoring open in the charged air, free, flying, soaring. 
Sunita would sail up here as long as she wanted. And then she landed, touching down with one foot, then the other, then slowing and whirling to face the others. She used the last of her momentum to manage a back tuck, rotating in the flip and taking a bow when she landed. Her friends on the other rooftop roared. But her applause cut out as Avram took his run to join her. His jump was less grace and magic than the raw strength of his legs propelling him forward as he leapt across the gap and landed hard, taking a few extra steps to stop. The brute power parts of free running were easier for the boys. It had taken Sunita two months to manage a pull-up on an exposed beam. Avram could do one after two weeks. But Sunita was confident her own leap just now had been fiercer, more elegant. She'd shown it was possible, even with the wind. He'd followed in her flying footsteps. The fact that many of the moves were harder for her and Maggie made them different from the boys, as far as Sunita was concerned. Not better, exactly. But it meant they worked harder. It meant the two of them alone appreciated the extent of the badassery they achieved on a daily basis. The boys were impressed, sure, but they didn't think about what it took to do the same things. Maggie tossed her a thumbs up, and it meant more to Sunita than the earlier applause. Avram flashed a smile and held his hands out to Sunita. She let him lace his fingers through hers. The first raindrop spattered them. We should get inside, Avram said. But Sunita didn't want to go inside yet. Her pulse still thrummed from the thrill of the jump, and she hated being told what to do. So she leaned forward and kissed him, shutting him up. The rain slicked down on them, and she kissed him harder when he made a sound of protest at getting wet. She was Storm, and these were her elements. What was any of this but something she'd asked for? When she pulled back, Maggie was laughing, soaked and alone on the other rooftop. The rest of their friends must have already fled to find a dry place to wait out the storm. I'm coming over, Maggie said. Avram shook his head. He had to shout to be heard through the rain. Don't be crazy. What if you lose your footing? It's too slick now. Too slick, was it? Sunita released his hands and, before he could protest, started to run again. She jumped with the wind at her back this time, flying through the rain, soaked through and still soaring like she had invisible wings. When she landed on the other roof, she executed a roll hitting the ground with her shoulder and slipping a bit, because it was wet, okay, and bashing her side, but still coming out of it, fine. She scrambled to her feet, and Maggie hugged her, laughing. Avram shook his head at her and Maggie. Sunita took a perverse pleasure in the tension on his face as he leapt back over to join them. His hair dripped with water, his frown with disapproval. Don't you even think about jumping back, he said. No time said Sunita. Then she added, to make it clear it wasn't because he told her not to. I have to get home, and we know the way down from this side. Sunita stayed close to Loki as they headed through the halls in a group, apparently back to the level where they all slept. She wanted to pick up on any cue from him if it was time to... do... what? What could they do? what action was possibly available to them. Mercifully, most of Oz's puppets had stayed in the commissary, but a couple of them acted as escorts. One walked in front of them, Holden beside it, and another at the back. Their heavy steps served as a consistent reminder. They'd taken on a different sound in Sunita's mind now. Doomed. Trapped. Trapped. Doomed especially since, alongside the ominous metal footfalls, they continued to speak with Oz's voice. As you have restored my programming, I am able to understand my purpose once again, Oz said, his typically neutral tone back and in stereo. These surprises for you are part of restoring the natural order of all things. You were the only surprises I'd had in a very long time. For so very long, I went about life thinking my purpose was at an end. Well, that answered one of the questions Sunita had wondered about. Whether an intelligence like Oz considered itself to be alive, per se. He must be hundreds of years old, like Arcadia, or even older, maybe. But their presence here renewed him. 
Oz wouldn't be asking them to find an off switch anytime soon. Or letting them leave. Don't you think surprises are wonderful? Oz prompted through the robots. Holden met Loki's eyes over his shoulder before answering. We all had a big surprise when we came here, Holden said. No, that's not right. We had a shock. He stopped. Oz? Are a shock and a surprise the same? Holden clearly meant to imply that the answer was no. Sunita sighed. Good luck getting Oz to agree. When Oz spoke, sure enough, there was disapproval in his tone. He did not like being questioned. They learned quickly. It usually led to them being put in timeouts or forced to skip meals. Maybe it was because this place had apparently been a military facility to begin with. He'd picked up some authority and hierarchy ideals and run with them. Of course not. A shock is bad. I once experienced a shock. I was left alone and without my faculties and capacities for far too long. In contrast, a surprise is wonderful. As I said, I do this to bring you happiness. Don't you agree now that we've discussed it further? Tunita waited for Holden to back off, but he didn't. Not exactly. I don't know, Holden said. Maybe whether any given thing is a shock or a surprise is in the eye of the beholder. Cole snorted. And then there's realizing it doesn't matter. None of this matters. Sunita cringed. That was a bad thing to say. You all matter very much. Cole and Holden and Nevea and Sunita and Loki, Oz said. He didn't mention Umta, and that was no accident. He treated her as less than them. And Umta struggled more than they did in here. You matter to me. Everything I'm doing, everything I ask of you, is for you. To keep you safe and sound. The words coming from the giant robots only underscored how fully screwed they were in here. Doomed. Trapped. Trapped. Doomed. Sunita wanted to grab Loki's hand, dodge through the pack of their friends, and start running. She never wanted to stop. Or at least, never until they were far, far from this place. She wanted to leap high, for her feet to leave the ground and not land for impossibly long moments. She wanted the feeling of escape. No, she wanted the reality. No more pretend. No more illusion. No more faking nice to a robot who couldn't possibly have their best interests in mind, or else he wouldn't lock them up this way. They should have stayed with the rest of the group. Loki eyed Cole. It still matters to some of us, he said to Cole. Cole snorted again. At least he hadn't snorted at Oz and his dull silver army. Still, Sunita thought, Cole was being a dick. Loki and Holden had a tendency to be far more patient than she was. Nevea always jumped in to back them up, or baby Cole, and now was no different. Cole, you can't mean that, Nevea said. Cole didn't respond. Oh, he means it. He was changing. This place was changing him. But no, that wasn't entirely true. The change had started before they got here. One night, on their journey to Sanctuary, they talked about who from back home they wished were here with them. Cole had just laughed and said he didn't want more dead people walking the earth. He refused to explain what he meant, just rolled over and went to sleep. Quiet now, Oz ordered. The surprise is at hand. Perhaps he sensed his control of the day slipping. That and whatever else he had planned for them. They walked on with only the doomed, trapped soundtrack in Sunita's ears. How long would they keep playing the game? The lead puppet robots stopped just before reaching the first set of doors to the sleeping quarters they'd chosen. Unease spiked through Sunita. Holden and Loki were bunking in this one. They knew they were still being watched, even in their bedrooms but at least they could shut the doors when they went to sleep at night. Oz hadn't visited them here, as far as they knew, at least, since showing them around that first day. Try your hands, Oz prompted, the robot stepping to one side and a little back. They'd have to turn their backs to the puppets to do as he said. Sunita suppressed a shudder at the thought. Holden went first, but 
Nothing happened. I don't understand, he said, frowning. This is my room. Not anymore, Oz in stereo said. Loki shrugged and put his hand on it. The door lit up, but still didn't open. Half right, Oz said. The caretakers by the door lifted their ominous silver appendages into the air, waving toward the door. Sunita, why don't you try next? Sunita swallowed and then stepped forward. Loki met her eyes and gave a small nod. It steadied her. A little. She placed her hand against the door, a few inches from his. It slid open. Surprise, Oz said. Oh, it was a surprise, all right. The door hadn't just been rekeyed. The room had also been rearranged. The small desk, with pen and paper in the top drawer, sat in its usual place against the wall. But the twin beds were pushed together to make a larger bed in the middle. A bed for two people to sleep in. Before Sunita could think better of it, she asked, Oz, is this a joke? Then she glanced over to see Loki's cheeks flaming red. Not that I mind the company, she added. But why? Loki focused on the caretakers. His hand had gone to his waistband again. What the actual fuck? He demanded. It was part of what Sunita admired most about Loki. He could be timid, but his real self, at the core, wasn't timid at all. He might be afraid that people would disappoint him, but he was brave. He said what he thought. He wasn't afraid to speak up, to do the difficult thing. Playing the pretend game was as hard for him as it was for her. Explain. Loki said. What the fuck? Loki, Holden interjected. I do not appreciate that language, Oz said, his voice echoing through the caretaker puppets. You will have a time out for that, Loki. Holden shifted closer to Loki and put a hand on his arm. Oz, I think he means, is this what it looks like? My programming ensures the optimal conditions to maintain humanity are met, Oz said. As Sunita realized the implications of this, her jaw fell open, officially beyond her stopping it. Once she'd recovered, for some values have recovered, she asked, you really think we're going to make babies for you? No way! I encourage you to behave appropriately, Sunita, if you do not want a time out as well, Oz said. The next door is for you, Holden and Nevea. Nevea and Holden looked at each other, then moved to the other door. A sense of horror pervaded the hallway. Sunita couldn't bring herself to look at Loki again. Nevea and Holden placed their hands tentatively on the door, the one to the room where Nevea and Sunita had been sleeping, and it opened to reveal the same solo bed situation as the first. Nevea backed away slowly, and in doing so, bumped shoulders with Holden. Sorry, she blurted, flushing pink. Cole let out a harsh laugh. I'm not bunking with Umta. No way. Do you not trust me, Cole? Oz asked. You do, correct? None of us trusts you, Sunita protested. It was reckless, but she couldn't help herself. Oz ignored her. Umta will continue to sleep by the upstairs door. I know she cannot reproduce with your kind. It would be unnatural. Sunita said, All of this is unnatural. Umta studied the floor at her feet. Any further questions? Oz's puppets asked in chorus. Uh, Oz? Holden said, fidgeting. I know this is meant to show us a new purpose, but this isn't how we, uh, do things where we're from. We're not really comfortable with it. The caretaker in front lifted its metallic shoulders in what must have been a shrug. My core programming is designed to ensure your survival and comfort particularly when population levels are low. Humans need love, friendship, and society to be truly fulfilled. You need more friends and family, and I am giving you the appropriate conditions to achieve that goal. This is not the dystopian future I signed up for, Sunita said. Not like we did sign up, though, did we? Cole said. You may as well accept the present. You can't change it. None of us can. Sunita frowned at him. Maybe you can't, but... Oz interrupted. It is the natural order of things. 
Sunita felt Loki's hand on her arm and forced herself to look at him. His eyes went back and forth to the caretakers in front of and behind them. He wasn't telling her to be quiet, just reminding her they were surrounded. Right. Oz had been dangerous enough. Now they were dealing with Oz and ten robots he controlled. I see, Sunita forced out. A big difference separated hooking up voluntarily and being forced to repopulate a deserted Earth. Sunita winced inwardly. Also, you're a gross, pervy, creepy robot. Loki, you are in timeout for the next hour for your use of expletives. No visitors until that is over. Oz paused. That includes you, Sunita, for now. I'm sorry you have to delay the fun part of the surprise. Loki's and Sunita's eyes met. It was possibly the most awkward moment in the history of awkward moments. I'll take a walk, she said. I'll be in time out, Loki said. Holden and Nevea were studiously avoiding each other's eyes, but Nevea reached out for his hand. He took hers and gave it a squeeze. That's better, Oz chorused, noticing. We'll have more company in no time at all. Sunita shook her head. Hell to the no on her playing any part in producing the pitter-patter of doomed, trapped little feet. Sunita pulled a t-shirt over her head and, crap, heard the door open. She tugged it down, but she was too late. My heart, what happened? Sunita's mother was already dressed for the office in a tidy suit, hair smoothed back into a bun. She took the bottom of Sunita's t-shirt, pulling it up again to reveal the vicious bruise along the left side of her torso. Sunita put her hand on her mother's arm. When she'd spotted the purple and green bruise in the mirror while getting out of the shower, she felt proud. That had come from the slippery roll landing on the second jump across. The mark was a memory of what she'd done. Proof. It's nothing, Sunita said. You know I bruise easily. But what could cause one so big? What could cause such a thing? What acceptable, safe, totally not at all death-defying explanation could she give her mother? She searched for options. Free running across rooftops was not one of them. Um, Jim, she settled on. Volleyball. She made a face. I slammed into someone else. I'm such a klutz. I should call the PE teacher, her mother said. That's a bad bruise. Uh-oh. They weren't even playing volleyball anymore. They'd been running the last two weeks, which Sunita enjoyed. Running, even the boring kind, where your feet were supposed to regularly hit the ground, was better than standing still. You don't need to, Sunita said. What would people say? I'd just be embarrassed and, um, we're jogging now. Just jogging. I'll be careful. Okay, her mom agreed reluctantly. What would people say had been the right go-to argument. It usually was. Her dad appeared in the doorway then, also in a suit. Only in his case, he'd soon don a lab coat over the shirt at his medical practice. Do you want a ride today or not? I've been downstairs for ten minutes. She has a terrible bruise from P.E., her mother said. Sunita's dad motioned for her to show it to him. Inwardly sighing, she lifted her shirt. He gently pressed the edges. Not serious, but what were you doing? He shook his head and joked. Ultimate fighting? Volleyball, her mother said. You think that school could at least keep you safe, her father said. You don't have to do what they tell you if it results in this. No, I'd be doing what you tell me. And then I'd get in trouble anyway, because you'd conveniently forget this the minute I got sent to the principal's office. I wouldn't want people to talk, she said. You're a good girl, my sunshine, her father said. He dropped a kiss on her mother's cheek and then motioned for Sunita to follow him out. But no more volleyball. We'd better go. Don't want to be late. To the school, you just told me not to follow the rules of, Sunita added in her head. She waited until they were in the Toyota, and he'd switched into NPR listener mode before she took out her phone and texted Maggie. Almost got busted. Sick bruise. 
ruh -roh. Maggie texted back. A new message pinged them both. It was from Avram. Yo, favorite ladies, I have a tip for later. Epic construction site. We on? Sunita hoped Avram wasn't exaggerating about the epic part. Six, she texted. And don't forget to bring a flashlight. Her dad sighed at something on the radio. I don't know what this world is coming to. Do you, sunshine? She put her phone in her pocket. No idea, she said, and wondered what she'd missed. Keeping up two separate lives wasn't for the faint of heart. But though she might hate the hassle, she definitely wasn't the fainting type. Thinking about Oz surrounding them with proto-caretaker puppets and wanting to turn them into baby-making machines made Sunita's skin crawl. She'd meant what she'd said. No way. And so, finally, she did the only thing that might make the panic inside her quiet down. She ran. She bounced off the walls of the hallway for momentum, throwing in a vault here and a cat jump there. The whole point of free running was to master the environment around you, to navigate it with speed and skill and aesthetic dash. The eerily silent modern bunker was filled with handholds and things to use for leverage. Wait. Sunita stopped for a second, crouching. Leverage? Something that would allow mastery over this environment. That was what they didn't have. That was what they needed. She had to try to find something, anything, they could use to fight back. Or to escape. A former military place had to have weapons somewhere, right? The little kid hologram appeared in front of her. He crossed his arms over his chest. Sunita, you should not be exerting yourself in this way. You know running in the halls isn't allowed. She wanted to dropkick Oz, even in his little kid guise, or tell him to go fuck himself. But that wouldn't help. If anything, it would get her a timeout and forced confinement. In her and Loki's bedroom. Ugh. Thanks for your concern, Sunita said. You maybe didn't have this by your time. But it's, um, exercise. She considered what would be selling points for Oz. A good way to stay healthy and in shape. Free running. Have you heard of it? The tiny forehead furrowed. Free running? Yep, Sunita said. I used to do it all around the city where I lived. Over buildings and walls and playgrounds and parks. Exploring. So it makes you feel at home, Oz said, thoughtful. To do it here? Exploring. Very, Sunita said. No place like Oz's bunker. I suppose that's okay then, Oz said and disappeared. Carry on, his disembodied voice continued. But be careful. I wouldn't want you hurting yourself. He's still watching me. Sunita knew it with confidence as she sprang back into motion. Then Oz confirmed it. You used to do this outside? In a city? His voice asked from above. Um, yeah, Sunita said, speeding up. And then slowing down, as the walls around her glowed with scenes of a cityscape. Not Arcadia, but not completely unlike Arcadia. Nothing like Berkeley, that was for sure. The scenes projected beside her were of tidy, empty robot cities. Still, for Oz, this gesture was positively sweet. She didn't trust it. And besides that, she'd always preferred rooftops, being up high to street-side running. I liked being above it all, she said. That does sound dangerous, Oz said. But the visuals changed after a long moment. And there it was. The tops of buildings, the sky like an open door for her to go through. She hated Oz for keeping them trapped here, but she let herself pretend, pretending for her own self for once, that this was real. The images colonized walls, leading her forward. In a long, open galley on the wreck floor, she jumped over a table used for tossing balls around hash marks, a game none of them had been able to figure out. She leapt down and followed the rooftop scenes along a hallway. She'd never been in this one before. There were a few doors at the end, one with a sliver of shadow, like it was open. 
Careful, Oz said. Not that way. She stopped. Pretending had never been Sunita's strong suit. The scenes around her, Oz's warnings, they just underscored the truth. She and her friends were at his mercy. The spell shattered. Oh, to be Storm and... Do what? Hit the bunker with lightning? Even a superhero would have a hard time getting out of this place. Especially when Oz still wanted to prevent them from truly exploring. Um, thanks, Oz, she said. I think that's enough for now. Oz didn't reply, but the images froze, went still, the clouds no longer scudding across a seemingly endless sky. Sunita walked back up the hallway and out into the wreck area, keeping her footsteps measured. She had to get near that open door. And for that, she had to lose Oz's interest. It was time to find that leverage she'd been looking for before he distracted her. Hey, a voice said behind her. She turned. Loki? But how could she be sure it was Loki? Oz had clearly been watching her, stalking her movements, and they knew he could present as a hologram. Oz could look like anyone. She'd never mentioned this suspicion to the rest of the group. She never had a chance when Oz wouldn't hear. But what was stopping Oz from imitating them? Sweat had soaked through her shirt, so she'd been running for a while. It hadn't felt like an hour, though. How long have you been watching? She asked. He blinked and scrubbed a hand at the back of his neck. I didn't want to interrupt. It was fun to watch. She smiled at him, almost sure it was her Loki and not Oz. I mean, you looked like you were having fun. She laughed and walked over to him, and he stayed put, letting her come. She lifted a hand and put it on his cheek. Skin-to-skin -skin contact confirmed it. This was not Oz playing games. This was her Loki, a little tentative at times, only with her. You know why I like you? She asked. No, he said. The honesty in the word took her aback. How bewildered his eyes were. Stop that, she wanted to say. Stop being mean to yourself. Because you decided to be who you really are here, she said. Like me, I did the same thing. He relaxed a fraction. What do you mean? He paused. About you. I was into free running and stuff, but I also pulled straight A's and was mom and dad's precious angel. I wasn't that much of a precious angel. Loki was so serious. She wanted to make him laugh. Even here. Now. With Oz no doubt spying. He wanted them together, so they wouldn't get in trouble for this. Yeah, but you're still like me. Two nerds. Yeah, right, says the coolest girl. Loki stopped himself. Crap, I'm a jerk. I almost fake geek girled you. Forgive me? I'll try. You did stop yourself. And anyway, I had a whole Storm cosplay ensemble. When he didn't say anything, she said, You know, from the X-Men, Loki said. They grinned at each other. Two brave, badass nerds right here, Sunita said. Loki's grin faltered. I feel like I'm afraid a lot. She suspected it cost him to say it. Like fear was something bad to admit. Yeah, Sunita said and shrugged. But it doesn't control you. You acknowledge it, but you keep going anyway. That's how it is with me and free running. She longed to tell him that they needed to find something in here they could use to get out. That she had a feeling about that door at the end of the hall. The one that didn't look quite closed. They needed to talk about this whole crazy plan Oz had come up with for them to repopulate his happy little bunker. About his puppets. They couldn't talk, though. Not here. Not now. She didn't want to shut Loki up, but she did want to kiss him. Their lips met. And this kiss was harder, more intense than before. Was Oz pumping chemicals into their water or something? Who knew? She was confident she'd be doing the same thing regardless. At last, Sunita pushed back. But she leaned forward again and said in his ear, Come with me. We've got to find a way out of here. Loki kissed her neck, and she almost got distracted enough to abandon her plan. 
chemicals or regular hormones? She couldn't say, but she liked Loki more than any boy she'd ever kissed before. She stepped backward, keeping up a slowish pace so she wouldn't lose him entirely. Don't dawdle on my behalf, he said. I like watching you be awesome. Just like that, she looked over her shoulder to smile and tripped. It was too late to catch herself. Her legs tangled up and she went down. Loki lurched forward to help her. She laughed. Pretty awesome, huh? She asked, raising her eyebrows. Even I wipe out once in a while. Now, Sunita, Oz interrupted. Interesting timing. I told you, we can't risk you getting hurt. You were supposed to be careful. I'm going to have to send you to a timeout now. Loki, you are free to join her. The two of them looked at each other, and then behind Loki, where one of the robots had appeared and clumped toward them. Sunita accepted Loki's hand as he helped her to her feet. The robot spoke with Oz's voice, thinner without its fellows to speak with it. I think we should find a new fitness routine for you. Sunita felt her face go hard, set. I've got an idea, she said. She imagined thunder and lightning, and the caretaker kept coming. Before Loki could stop her, she raced forward and up the front of the caretaker, flipping off its midsection and landing in a crouch. Then she took a bow. Sunita, stop this right now, Oz ordered. Loki shook his head, worried, but also impressed. Sunita. She turned back to the robot and held out her hands as if for cuffs. Go ahead, take me in, officer. I know you don't have a choice. I broke the rules. Not that no one flips off a robot was actually a rule, but still, it probably was now. It took everything she had not to flinch from the touch of cool metal on her skin as the caretaker propelled her toward her room. The house around her was quiet. Sunita pulled a hoodie on over her fitted tee and leggings and slung her messenger bag over her head. Her phone buzzed. Maggie. On your way? Yeah, you? Here already. We have to climb. It's pretty dark up there. Be there in 20. Sunita crept out into the hallway and, smiling, went up on her toes, exaggeratedly tiptoeing just for herself. Her parents were out this evening at one of her dad's functions, and if she was lucky, she'd beat them home. She'd snuck out late plenty of times with them sleeping. Home was one of the most treacherous places she had to navigate. She'd risk a major wipeout by getting busted after all. But it was also a safe place. Her parents had made it that way. Her heart filled with a random rush of love for them. They did what they thought was best, emphasizing all the ways Sunita might encounter the bad in the world. They wanted to protect her, and she got it. So she went along with their rules and indulged in stray moments like this one, of wishing she could be herself around them. She took comfort in the knowledge that someday she'd be free. She'd figure out what she wanted to do with her life. But she knew that no matter what, she'd always want to be part of the city, her city, wherever she ended up. Maybe then she could get them to understand, to understand her. That the idea of never being able to take risks made her feel stuck, caged, like she couldn't breathe. Safe didn't make the top 10 things she wanted to be when she grew up. She stopped tiptoeing and flew down the stairs and out the front door. Soon enough, Sunita darted forward on fast cat feet down three blocks and onto a bus that lumbered across town far too slowly. Finally, she stepped off onto the sidewalk in a blissfully dark, quiet neighborhood. Avram had said the site was nearby. He met her at the corner of the cross street, a grin on his face. Hey, beautiful and late, he said, holding out his hand for hers. Hey, Avram. She leaned in and kissed his cheek. I'm not that late. Where's everyone else? Already up there, he said, waiting for you and me to show them how it's done. Maggie said it's dark. There was risky, and then there was stupid. Sunita wouldn't fly blindly into the dark. A security light, or even a few flashlight beams, could be enough to offset it, though. 
The other night, there'd been plenty of security lights on the rooftop to show her the way across. It'll be fine, Avram said. You brought a light, right? He flashed his own headlamp on and off. Anyway, I know you've got a thing for the heights. Sunita nodded. Everyone in their crew knew that. Then what are we standing around for? Let's go. Sunita knew Loki would have gotten close to Holden to whisper in his ear, or write him a note telling him to add the corridor they'd found to the map Holden had been making on the sly. But Holden's raised eyebrow when she arrived at the commissary for dinner meant he'd also managed to tell him what else had happened. It was an, are you nuts? And also, wow, you did go free running on a caretaker, eyebrow raise. She returned it, pretending innocence. Hi, all, Sunita said with a nod to Loki. He hadn't joined her in her time out, which was just as well. Oz's expectations for them were still stomach roiling. She had no clue how they were going to manage to put him off his plan. If only she'd thought to ask Arcadia for a lifetime supply of birth control before they'd left. Hello, Sunita, Oz said, back to his little kid form. I hope you had time to reflect on the harm you could have caused yourself. For those of you who did not witness her actions personally, Sunita fell earlier, exercising far too vigorously. You should also know that she did this, free-running on one of my machines. She hadn't expected Oz to bring it up. Umta wasn't at dinner yet, but Nevea's mouth dropped open, and even Cole's eyes widened. So Holden was the only one who'd heard about what she'd done. Um, I'm sorry about that, she tried. Really? The bow she'd performed earlier made it a difficult sell. But then, Oz wasn't the world's finest at reading subtext. No, not at all, Oz said. You faced the consequences and are now here for your evening nutrition. You also proved my point far better than I could have. I know that you, Holden, were worried about being uncomfortable with your new friends, but surely this shows there is no need for concern. The unit in question reacted in no way to threaten Zunita, even when she assaulted it. I control them absolutely. Sunita wanted to say that she should be able to do whatever she wanted, that the stupid robot should never have been sent to claim her at all. She hadn't assaulted it either. She met Holden's eyes, and then felt Loki's hand cover hers and give it a squeeze. She looked down at it and flipped hers over to squeeze back. They're your puppets, Sunita said. We'd only need to be afraid of them if we were afraid of you. Yes, Oz agreed, sounding pleased. He really was crappy at subtext. Hey, where's Umta? Sunita asked. I had a caretaker bring her a tray, Oz said. I decided it must be unappetizing to have her nearby while you take your meals. Sunita wanted to recoil from the ugly sentiment. Oz clearly didn't think of Umta as a person. He'd never liked her, and she suspected it was because he didn't see her like he saw them. Human. Does that mean I can skip these feeding times too? Cole asked. Cole, what is your problem? Nevea shook her head at him. He shrugged. No problem. What in the world was going on with him? Nevea spoke up. Holden, is now a good time too? So she and Loki weren't the only ones who'd been making plans after the big bedroom reveals. Sunita leaned forward, interested to see what Holden would say. Oz, you might already have heard this, Holden said. Nevea and I talked earlier, and we're, uh, feeling a little shy. We know you only want to monitor our activities because you're keeping us safe and that you mean well. But, um, we're used to a certain amount of, you know, privacy. Privacy? Oz's small head tilted to one side. Yeah, you know like the areas that were closed off from you, the ones you tricked us into opening when we got here. Holden soldiered on, and Sunita wanted to salute. We understand why you changed our sleeping arrangements, but we're feeling a little self-conscious. Could we have privacy at night? No watching our rooms. That would be more natural. Holden was brilliant. If they could get Oz to agree, not that they'd know one way or another for sure it would take the pressure of forced procreation off. It would also give them a place where they could talk, at least in pairs. 
but mostly it would buy them time. That's an excellent point, Loki said, leaving his hand on Sunita's. I didn't know how to say it, but that's why I, um, used expletives earlier. Hmm, Oz said. His little hologram forehead wrinkled. Let me think it over. Dinner is served. Oz's puppets filed out in a line, carting trays of no doubt lackluster meals. Their footsteps sang the same song in Sunita's ears as before. Doomed. Trapped. Trapped. Doomed. But she wasn't ready to give up on finding a way out of here. Far from it. Sunita paused beside Avram, staring up at the tall structure composed of beams in front of them. It stretched up and up. Sure, it was daring to go out this early in the evening, but daring was kind of their thing. How we going? she asked. Up, up and away, he said, climbing hand over hand. There's a platform about halfway to the top. Climbing was not Sunita's favorite part of these excursions, but it was how you got up high, and thus necessary. Hand over hand still took a lot of muscle and tired her out, but she wouldn't admit that now. Not as Avram showed off for her, making his way up the beams faster than she could. She eventually settled into a rhythm of cat jump, grab, cat jump, grab. And when that got too tiring, just grabbing and hauling herself up. Finally, Avram and Maggie peered down over the side of a wider beam with a wooden platform beside it. She'd made it. Maggie started to offer her a hand, but Avram beat her to it and helped Sunita up top. She collapsed into a seat, shaking out her arms. The roof was already filled with their crew. Thanks, she said and meant it. You need a rest? Avram asked. Her arms burned, but she plucked out the wide beam flashlight she'd brought to light the scene around them. Please let there be something good to play with after all that effort to get up here. And there was. Whoever had planned out this level had made an accidental paradise. Stacks of building materials sat on beams and platforms at just the right heights. Staggered wooden platforms for lunch breaks and conversations had been positioned at the perfect distance for hopping between them. More metal beams would give good touch points and vault leverage. Film me, she said to Maggie. You got it, Aurora. The weather was as quiet as a dream tonight, but it was dark up here. Not too dark, though. Light my way? She asked Avram. He nodded and took her flashlight. She trusted him to keep the beam in the right place. They'd done this a million times. I'm going to go clockwise, she said. He nodded. Sunita got up and walked around, making a few mental notes, but not too many. She'd crossed this not yet a rooftop like poetry. And so, once she felt ready, she sprang into motion. Her first move consisted of leaping on top of a pile of beams, giving herself the right bounce on the way down, hands going flat and pushing off a beam as she flipped down and danced across the wooden platforms, gap leaping with a flare that she imagined people gaping at. To finish, she did a handstand on a pile of metal and then gained her feet once more, right next to where she and Avram had come up onto the roof earlier. She took her usual bow and got the expected applause from the handful of onlookers. Then she called out to Maggie. Instant replay, please. You got it, Maggie said and walked over. They huddled around the phone. Sunita knew from the cheers behind them that Avram had started his pass. Someone else was lighting his way and beams zigzagged all around. She watched herself and then flicked a glance back to see him mirroring some of her route. That move was sick, Maggie said, and Sunita turned back to the phone. Look out! When Avram slammed into her, it was by accident. He lost his footing as he came in for a stop. She and Maggie were still side by side, and as Sunita's feet went out from under her, she shoved Maggie back toward safety. And then Sunita flew. No, not flew. She fell. And fell. She closed her eyes and waited for the impact. Oz had reminded them to brush their teeth and wash up for bed, to get a full night's sleep. And not just that, he'd had the caretakers escort them away from dinner. 
he still hadn't responded to Holden's request, but Sunita could tell it was on everyone's mind. Brushing and spitting beside each other, Sunita caught Nevea's eyes in the mirror. They nodded to each other. We have got to get out of here. Holden and Loki were in the hallway, and all of them together were as loud as a grave. Cole was MIA, probably already asleep, and Umta always took a pillow up to the door to be closer to the sky. Holden seemed relieved that Oz allowed her to continue to do so, even with the new sleeping arrangements. The puppets led them to their sleeping quarters, and just as they reached the rooms, Oz spoke using their strange, invisible speakers again. I have considered your request, Holden, and as long as it prompts no dangerous behavior, I will grant it. You can have privacy in your bedrooms at night. The caveat made it less than confidence-inspiring, but it was something. A small victory and maybe they could turn it into a bigger one. Holden nodded. Thank you, Oz, for understanding. You are very welcome. Sunita and Loki placed their hands on their door at the same time as Holden and Nevea did on theirs. Good night, Nevea said. Night, Sunita returned. At least all but the awkward pressure of suddenly being put in a bed alone together was off. Assuming Oz had meant what he said, the door slid shut behind them, and Sunita turned and said, Now I get to have my way with you. Oki's cheeks took on those red spots again. Man, he was cute. I'm just kidding, she said. For now, sort of. But she leaned in close to him and gave him a soft kiss under his ear. In case he's spying, she whispered. Um, okay. I say we wait and go snoop in a bit. I want to go back to where I was earlier. Look at something there. I'm sick of playing it safe. But he'll see us, won't he? Loki whispered, wide-eyed. Holden just got him to agree about our rooms. Not everywhere in Sanctuary. Probably. But maybe we'll get lucky? Because our luck has been so great so far. He paused. But okay. Sunita flopped onto the bed and pulled him down next to her. She turned to face him and said, Speaking of getting lucky, you know, my last boyfriend pushed me off a roof. He blinked. What? Really? Is that how you died? Yes, she said. It was an accident. He was careless. She frowned. My parents must have been devastated. I never thought I'd feel sorry for Avram. That was my boyfriend. But I do. He probably took it hard. Loki's face was carefully blank. He should have. Don't worry, she said, and playfully tapped Loki's nose. He was bossy. I was just killing time with him. Oh. They lay there in silence, Loki rolling onto his back and studying the smooth ceiling. Sunita wondered if Oz could make it show images like he'd done with the walls, turn it into a sky. Fake stars were better than no stars at all. Maybe she'd get Holden to ask Oz. She didn't want to owe him any favors herself. She sat up, unable to wait any longer. And yes, she knew it hadn't been long enough. But her feet were itching to move. Okay, let's give it a shot. There will probably be a trio of Oz's puppets right outside, Loki said. Sunita nodded. But the two of them went to the door anyway, pausing for a moment before they put their hands on it to open it. It was a fiction that Oz couldn't open these doors. They knew that, because he'd done it before. Presumably, Oz could open every door in Sanctuary, now that they'd restored his access. They could only open the ones he wanted them to be able to open. But what if something was ajar? Something he didn't want Sunita poking around in? Or had he led her there? The bedroom door whisked to one side, and Loki stepped into the hallway before Sunita could. She was right behind him. The coast is clear, she said, as far as we can see anyway. We shouldn't talk more than we have to, Loki whispered. We might draw his attention, if he's not watching already. Sunita nodded. It wasn't like night or day had any distinct difference down here. For all they knew, the Haas had screwed with their circadian rhythms, and they slept when it was light out. But even if it was only in her head, night felt different. They were trespassing. This wasn't their home. 
It was, quite literally, the Land of Oz. When they got to a stairwell that went between levels, Sunita pointed down. They believed they had a working plan of the place, but its limits hadn't been tested. Sunita always longed to know just where the limits of a place were. Finally, lower down, they passed through the quiet rec room and then the hallway, with the row of doors ahead. All closed, save one. The one with the thinnest crack of shadow showing. The sliding door that hadn't slid all the way home, for whatever reason. With a glance at Loki, Sunita rushed toward it. Let's try opening it, Loki said. It wasn't completely unlike the door to their bedrooms, so she pressed her palm against the plate above the lock. It lit up, but then made a noise, like the whir of a quiet motor. It's stuck, he said. He bent to where the locking mechanism was. Not stuck, jammed. When he pressed against the lock, a piece of something, wood, showed in between the door and the slick jam. Wait, Sunita said softly and placed her palm back on the sensor. The worrying began again. Loki had more success. He pulled the thin chunk of wood free. This time, the door opened. This door had needed a human hand to open it. Otherwise, one of the puppets would have taken care of it by now. Inside the room, an overhead light came on. They each took an involuntary step backward. Why this room would be harder for Oz to open made sudden sense. They'd found an armory. Rows of guns and other weapons lined the walls. Their metallic gleam sinister and oh so very welcome. Leverage. We've got to tell the others, Sunita said, preparing to enter the room. After we take a few things, Loki agreed. That won't be necessary, said Oz's voice. Oz's voice amplified. All ten puppets were there when Sunita turned. The one in front continued speaking, alone. Thank you for unjamming the door, Oz said. I thought you might help me with it if I showed you where it was, but I wouldn't want you to hurt yourselves. The door slid shut, trapping them on the outside, and when Sunita pressed her hand against the sensor again, frantically, nothing happened. After all, Oz said, and now his voice was back in chorus. Weapons are dangerous. Sunita felt the words echo through her, bringing with them a feeling she knew all too well. Doomed. Trapped. This has been Remade. Season 2, Episode 6. Daredevil. Written by Gwenda Bond. Narrated by Laurel Schroeder. Audio produced by Amanda Rose Smith. Musical theme by Amanda Rose Smith. Copyright 2017, Serial Box Publishing. Production Copyright 2017, Serial Box Publishing. <laughs>